Well, we really hear yeah. about coming out. Hope everybody's had a good week. Hope you come looking for the Lord to do something this mm -hmm. morning. You know, every time we come, the Lord be coming to look for help. And you know, if you've ever lived in a day and time we need help, it's right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I know that the Lord's able this morning. He can help us. I just pray it helps us a little while. How many glad you saved this morning? Amen. Amen. Good to be saved, headed to heaven. Hey, we know where we're going this morning. Don't have to worry about it. Whatever comes out of all of this that's going on. There's a lot of folks out there running around real confused right now. But you know, we've been warned years and years and years all these things that's coming. We're in them now. So I tell you what, we're going to see what we're made of, I guess, here in the next little bit. Just need to stand strong, stand firm for God, and He'll take care of us. You know, He's He's been doing that so far. Just keep believing in Him, have confidence in Him. Everything's going to be all right. We just keep trusting Him and praying. You got your Bible? Turn to the Book of Acts, chapter number ten. Book of Acts, chapter number ten. So we've had this scripture on our heart. I guess it's about Wednesday this weekend be much in prayer for us this morning. We're talking about some serious things here in the book of Acts chapter 10 and be dealing with one man in this chapter pretty, pretty much this morning, a man by the name of Cornelius. Again, we're going to read down through this whole chapter. It's going to be a little lengthy reading, but I believe we need to read all of it to see what's going on. Acts chapter number 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he had looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, The prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send me into Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. And he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which he spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants, a devout soldier of them, and waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And it became very hungry, and he would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descended unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that calleth not thou common? This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. But while Peter doubted in himself what this vision was, which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made an inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on this division, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubt nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee to his, into his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them and lodged them on the morrow. Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied them. 
And tomorrow after they entered into Caesarea, Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near, and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and told and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any, any common or unclean. Therefore I came I unto you with gain, saying, As soon as I was sinned, for I asked, therefore, what intent ye have sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And so, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He has lodged in the house of Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are well here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of truth, I perceive that is that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he feareth them, and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say now which was published throughout all Judea, began from Galilee after the baptism of John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And with, all, and with our witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of Jews and Jerusalem whom they slew and hanged on a tree, whom God had raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people but unto witnesses chosen before out of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that he is which was ordained of God to be judge of the quick and dead. To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth him shall re receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of circumcision which believed were astonished, and many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed him to tarry certain days. Now, there's quite a bit of reading there, but there's a lot of things that's mentioned in this chapter and this chapter pretty much is dealing with this man by the name of Cornelius. And you know, he lived in Caesarea, the Bible tells us, and that was about 30 miles from Joppe, where he had sent his men to find Peter. And the Bible even says this man Cornelius was a centurion. Now when you study about that word being a centurion, he was a non-commissioned officer, and he was probably in command of about 100 men in the Roman army. The Bible said he was a part of the Italian band. Now there's going to be a lot of things said about this man Cornelius. Now, if you look at him, Cornelius was not a Gentile. I mean, Cornelius was a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a part of that line of Jesus, those Jews, his people. He was like us. He was being outcast pretty much by the Jews and he wasn't a part of what went on, but if you'll study uh, this man Cornelius who was a Gentile, I guess you could say in a sense he was probably much a semi-prostolate to Judaism. He accepted a lot of the Jewish beliefs and practices, but I guess you could say he probably stopped and didn't go as far as circumcision. But when you look at this man Cornelius, the Bible talks about him being a good man. He was a religious man. He was 
pretty much probably well known in his community. He was a centurion. Everybody probably pretty much knew who he was. And if you look at him, I guess a little closer, he was a man that was probably or just a religious man, had a lot of religion about him. And you know, I, I thought the last few days, you know, religion is a dangerous thing without God. We've got a lot of that stuff going on in the day and time we're living in. Even right here in the mountains, we've got a lot of people that's got religion, but they don't have God. They've got a lot of beliefs, a lot of things that people's told them down through the years, but there's no God in it. They're just religion. And you know, religion that doesn't change you and leaves you the way you are is a really dangerous thing. You know, there's a difference in religion and getting a hold of true salvation and getting a hold of God. Hey, there's going to be a lot of people go to hell because they've got religion. You know, you've heard that said a whole lot. You hear it said about somebody that got religion. You know, I don't like that phrase. And I've heard, even hear that said about a lot of people that really got saved. They got salvation. Hey, there's a lot of different religions out there. But there's only one salvation that comes through and by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, here's a man by the name of Cornelius. Been a lot of wonderful things said about him in this chapter. You say, well, what could be wrong with this man by the name of Cornelius? He's lacking one thing in his life. He's doing a lot of things right. Cornelius is a lost man. Never been saved. Never been to Calvary. Like I said, he's a Gentile. He's been outcast. I mean, he's not in the circle with these Jews. He's a lost man. Now, Cornelius, I mean, if you study this, you know his the thing's good about this, though, his story didn't end with him being a lost man. You've got to read on down through the rest of this chapter and see what goes on in this man's life. And you know, I was reading this here the last few days, thinking about it, studying on it a little bit. And you know, I got to thinking, you know, I'm glad my story, my life didn't end with me being lost. Hey, I was a whole lot like this man, Cornelius. Had some religion in my life. I was doing some good things. Maybe doing things walking the right ways. Maybe even fooling some people. But man, I'm glad this one night the Holy Ghost come down and saved the little 10 year old boy. I'm glad my story didn't end with me lost and going to hell. Hey, I'm glad my story didn't end in the condition I was in. Hey, you read the rest of this story about Cornelius. Hey, there's some good things begins to happen in his life. And I want to look at this man Cornelius for a little while this morning and see what the Bible says about this thing. Now we need to remember before we get into this, so we need to remember that Jesus has been crucified already. He's rose from the dead and he's went back to heaven. And you remember the Lord had given the disciples the command to go out and preach the gospel. Go out into the world. But you remember they went to the Jew first. Then they were to go to the other people. The Jews come first. That was God's people. He said go preach to them. He wanted their eyes open. He wanted those that he chose to be saved. But they continually rejected. So he, the, then the, the, the disciples began to preach to the Gentiles. But you, you remember they were some of the Jews had a problem with this. A lot of the Jews believed salvation was only for them. It wasn't for anybody else. Hey, but God didn't die on Calvary just for the Jew. He died on Calvary for each and every person that's ever been born into this world. He died for everybody that's come into this world. So in Acts 10, I guess you'd say it's probably one of the first cases that you'll find some Gentiles being saved in the Bible. And man, we better be glad he began to save Gentiles. Because let me tell you something, me and you wasn't in, that, wasn't in that line. Me and you were Gentiles. We were outcasts. We were nothing. But they began to preach to the Gentiles. Peter came and preached to these folks at Cornelius' house. Let me say, Peter found something out early on in this chapter. God began to get deal with him there in that vision about the clean and unclean. 
And man, Peter realized, man, that they wasn't no different out of that vision than him and the Gentiles. He realized there was one God that was going to save whoever would come to them. So Peter realized here in Acts 10 that it was important to go spread the gospel. So let's look here in Acts chapter 10 about some things about this man by the name of Cornelius. Hey, the Bible says some good things about him. Some things that ought to be saved that ought to be said about saved people. The Bible says some things in verse 2 about Cornelius that ought to be said about church people. About people that's got their names on the roll, got their names on the book. About people that holds offices in the church that ought to be said about us. And these things are being said about lost men. So we ought to look at ourselves real closely. Look at verse number 2. The Bible said that Cornelius was a devout man. Now you look that word devout up, it, it means committed or devoted to religion or to religious duties or exercises. Bible said he was a devout man. You, you look at me and said you said he was lost. I believe you'll find out in just a few minutes Cornelius was a lost man. But you get down toward the end of the chapter, you don't find him that way any longer. The Bible said he was devout. Man, he was devout to his religion. And he wasn't even a Jew. He followed the customs of the Jews. I believe he dotted every I, crossed every T, everything that had to be done. He was devout. He was faithful. Hey, he was probably a man that was trustworthy. Everybody looked up to him. They trusted him in the community. Probably never missed a service that was going on. And you, you know that sounds good. The Bible said he was, de he was a devout man. But man, you read the rest of this story. Hey, wouldn't it be good to see some church members that it was said about them being devout? Them being devoted to God? I, I've never seen a day in time that we're less devoted than we are right now. And I'm talking about all churches as a whole. We're living in a time that we're devoted to everything but what's right. We're devoted to the job. We're devoted to the family. We should be. But man, all that comes before our devotion to God. All that comes before our devotion to prayer. You know, he got, this man Cornelius was giving it his all. I mean, he had his mind in it, had his heart in it. You ought to ask yourself this morning, how devoted am I to my salvation? Living right before a lost and dying world. And man, if we've ever lived right, we're living in the day and hour. We better be living right. We're living in an hour that people's looking to people like us right now to find answers. Hey, we're living in an hour that we need to walk right daily. Hey, we're talking about a good man right here that's devout. But this man's lost. And you know, I'm afraid we've got a lot of people like that man. They've lived their life in church. they sat on a church pew. They've went through the motions. They've held offices. They've done everything coming and going. And it looks good. But the inside's not right. You know, a lot of times if you'll just stop and see what you pay attention to most of the time, what you spend most of your time on, you'll find out what you're devoted to. Now there's a man, the Bible saying he's devout. This is the Bible saying this. Then the Bible went on in verse 2 and said, A devout man and one that feared God. I oh mean, this man had some godly fear about him. This is a Gentile, but he's realizing there's a higher power. He's realizing there's something out there that's a lot more powerful than he is. You know where our devotion ought to start at? It ought to start with fearing God. You know, I, I believe he had a godly fear. I believe he feared the Creator. I believe he realized they was a life giver that he needed to fear. Man, I believe he realized that, he, that the one that let the sun come up and let the one say it to what he ought to fear. You know, we're living in a generation right now that you don't see much fear of anything. This man had a godly religious fear. You ever stop and really ask yourself, how much do I really fear God? Man, I'm talking about the one that breathed this book. I'm talking about the one that stepped out on nothing.
something that created everything spoke it into existence. Man, I'm talking about the one that's got control of everything in his hand. Keeps this earth turning. Man, he keeps the grass growing. Keeps the rain coming. Hey, they talk about global warming and all that stuff. Hey, throw that junk out the window. Bible said there'd be spring, summer, winter, and fall. There'd be seasons. They're blowing millions of dollars on junk like that. And the Bible tells us, man, that they're going to be seasons. Hey, they say you study this thing back. Even a hundred years ago, there was times that we went through hot weather like it's been now. Well, it was winters that there wasn't much snow, wasn't much cold. This thing ain't changed like they're telling people. Hey, we need to start fearing God again. I mean, this man Cornelius had a godly fear about it. You know, we, we got a lot of folks anymore to walk up and stick their finger in God's face and say, I'm a God. We're going to do it my way. Hey, all this crowd that's running around the country protesting all this junk, they ain't got no fear of God. They ain't got one ounce of fear of God in them. If they did, they'd try to bring people together instead of tearing them further apart. All of them want to run down law enforcement, run down their families and everything. Hey, buddy, you better be glad you've got some law enforcement that'll stand up for you when something's going on. I know there's some bad apples in every bunch. Every job I've ever worked on in my life, they've been two or three, seems like wants to make it hard for everybody. Anywhere you go, it's that way. But some of these men, man's doing what's right. They're standing up for what's right. We ought to have enough backbone to stand up with them. Hey, man, we're living in a day and time the devil's running rampant right now. And we ought to have a godly fear of the devil. I've even heard preachers stand in the pulpit before and say they'd like to hit the devil in the face. Hey, I don't want to get that close to him. Hey, we ought to have a godly fear of him. He's running rampant right now. We need to have a godly fear of a real hell because hell is real. And man, there's millions of people going to hell. I wonder how all these folks has died with this COVID, how many was lost. How many folks do you think's dropped off into hell these last six months through this disease? How many folks are going to drop off into hell just because natural causes in the next few months? How long has it been since anybody's knocked on one of their doors that's lost and tell them Jesus loves them? People used to knock on doors and invite them to come to the house of God. They'd get a burden over people. They'd get down in the altar and have an all-night prayer meeting so folks would get saved. It seems like you ain't even hearing many people with all this going on right now, this pandemic. Then another hurricane getting ready to come up the coast again. Nobody's calling on God. They don't even want a preacher around anything anymore. There was a time they used to bring them in the White House when things would happen. And they'd go to pray and they'd try to give advice to the leaders. They don't want it no more. We don't have much fear of God. Man, I, I'm talking about a man right here that's lost in order to be an example to us. He's living right before a lost and dying world. Man, we're, we're in a mess in the nation we're living in, in our country, in our churches. Hey, most churches everywhere you go is like this one anymore, empty pews everywhere you look. You know, it's a shame. A lot of that ought to be on our shoulders. I don't think we have the burden. I don't think we have the heart or the fear that we used to have anymore. You say that's pretty plain. Man, plain, plain preaching gets across a lot easier in these big words, smoothing things over, making folks feel good when they go home. That ain't what it's about. We need to realize where we're at. This man right here was a devout man. He feared God. Look what else was said. The Bible said he gave much honor. That's talking about this man's giving right here. Giving to the poor. Giving money. Giving things to charity. Or it could probably even be an act of kindness or a good deed. And you know the, the Lord's seeing everything this man's doing and he's lost. Hey, you say you believe the Lord sees a lost man? Yeah, he sees everything he does. Hey, if he never gets saved, he'll be judged one day at the great white throne judgment of what he's done. Hey, this thing's not about works, so he had a lot of good works in his life. You know, some religion, man, is just all about works. Trying to enough, do enough good to outweigh the bad. Or trying to do enough good that one of these days the scales 
a violent child our way, it'll never violence out. They ain't the one that balanced this thing out. It was Jesus. He's the only one that lived perfect. Now Cornelius, he must have been a worker. I, I thought that man must have been out doing stuff all the time for people. Bible said he'd give much alms. Now that's talking about, yeah, I believe he helped the poor, the needy. I believe he helped those maybe that was going through a hard time, maybe lost their job. Hey man, there's many right now who's lost their jobs. Man, there's a lost world out there that needs help right now. But let me say, I don't know if Cornelius was depending on what he was doing to begin with or what. But man, this thing ain't about works. It's about the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. He's the one that done the work. Now works is a fruit of salvation. The Bible said faith without works is dead. And you know, depending on where you go one day, you're going to be judged for your works though. Your works ain't going to get you into heaven. They're a fruit of salvation. If you've been saved, we're going to go to the great, we're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ when we're after the ones that are saved when the Lord comes back. He's going to open the books, and I believe he's got it recorded day, time, and hour. Everything that we've ever done. Every sin we've committed. He's going to have every good work that we've ever done. But you know, you look there in the book of Corinthians where it talks about all that. Hey, you do one little thing, your works will be burnt. Hey, I might have some things stand. I might have a crown to lay down at his feet one day. Wouldn't you like to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant? Hey, we, we don't take the judgment seat of Christ with a lot of fear or seriousness. I mean, it's going to be an awful day. Yeah, if the Lord come back right now and take care of all our problems, but we got one more, the judgment seat of Christ. A lot of people think, I don't believe the tears are going to be wiped away until that judgment seat's over according to this book. Hey, he's going to lay it out there. And you know, I ain't going to have somebody to stand up for me. I'm not going to have a lawyer there. My family's not going to be able to. I'm going to be standing on my own. And I'm going to look him in the eye. Man, that's going to be a dreadful day. You ever stop and thought all the stuff you've done since you've been saved? Yeah, all the things you've done before you saved, God chose to forget. But you're going to be judged on these things. Hey, most of us has done enough to go to hell out of been saved. It was possible or to go to hell. But ain't you glad there's mercy and grace you won't let us go? But man, we're going to look him in the eye. He's going to open them books and he's going to say, you've done this, you've done that. And we're, we're, we're going to answer for ourselves, Man, I'm going to be ashamed a lot of things, the way I've lived, the way I've done. I mean, be honest this morning, we all ought to be ashamed. I mean, we're not fit to go to heaven. We're not fit to go to the kingdom. But he made a way that we could get there. You know, if you're lost this morning, hey, you're going to be judged too at the great white throne judgment. And man, we were to have some fear about this place. Because if we're saved, we're going to stand behind God and see these people judged. You ever thought, man, you may see some of your family being judged? Hey, those that are dead right now that are lost, hey, their soul is in a place called hell. And their soul's going to be brought out. Well, hell wouldn't be too bad if they got to come out. But they're going to come out at the great white throne judgment for a temporary period. I don't know how long it's going to take, but they're going to come out at the great white throne judgment and they're going to be judged. Hey, I, I don't know. I've gone off and wondered. I, I wonder what if God set that great throne, white throne judgment up like a, like a courtroom. We're going to all be set behind Him judging the world. Wouldn't it be something if God looked at some of them people and said, if you've got one last thing you'd like to say before you're cast in. Man, wouldn't it be awful one of them might point their finger at us and say, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me that place was that hot? Why didn't you tell me that hell's a place that's never going to end and this body won't burn up? Why didn't you tell me that there's a lake of fire waiting on me right now that they're going to bind me hand and foot? And I'm going to be cast into that thing forever. No coming out of a lake of fire. Man, that thing's talking about a lake. It's probably 
going to be moving. It says a lake of fire and brimstone. Hey, that brimstone's a rock that melts, man, and it runs. You imagine a, a fire that's so hot that it's putting off so much heat that it's going to be dark. Hey, I've seen some of these folks using equipment and stuff, cutting the stuff before the, the fire gets so hot you couldn't even see it, but it's cut. There's going to be a fire like that. People's going to live in that place. Bible said it's a place that the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Man, it's going to be a place people's going to scream. There's going to be smoke there. And there's going to be no rest, no going to sleep. It's going to be for eternity. And this man Cornelius was heading that way, but something good happened. Hey man, what we need to realize, man, this man Cornelius was a devout man. He feared God. He gave much. Look what else the Bible said about him. And a lot of folks are going to get confused right here. Bible said, and he prayed to God always. Now we see a lost man right here, Cornelius, that is praying. But I want you to get something out of this in just a minute. Cornelius has been doing all this right. He begins to talk to God. And the Bible said that his prayers went up to God before him for a moment memorial. And you know, the Bible teaches us, and this is not a contradiction, that every only prayer that God hears the lost man is a sinner's prayer asking him to save him. Hey, I wonder if old Cornelius didn't begin to call on God asking him for something. I believe this was probably the beginning of his sinner's prayer when he began to call on God daily. And God heard his hear this angel said he went up to God for remembrance. He had natured him yet. But this man began to call on God in a lost condition. I know this is hard to understand. I don't even like to get in trying to pray that I'm going to confuse people. But this man didn't know a whole lot about God. He didn't know nothing about salvation. But he began to call on an Almighty God. I believe he was under conviction and began calling on God. This may have been his sinner's prayer, doing it daily. God, please help me. I mean, how, how many folks, man, really pray like this man did daily? This man was lost. He began to call on God and God heard him. I'm glad when I was lost and called on him, he heard my prayer. How many of us prays daily like this man? Bible said to pray without ceasing, and that means continually. Hey, we all know we can't sit down and pray all day long, but we need to take time in the morning. Hey, when you're going down the road, you talk to God driving. Hey, you talk to Him when you're sitting by yourself. You talk to Him when you're working. Hey, it makes a day go by a lot better when you're working if you'll just talk to Him along the way. He'll keep good thoughts in your mind. He'll keep your mind man, from drifting off on everything in the world. Man, we need to pray like this man did. Hey, there ever been a day in hour we need to pray? It's right now. Hey, we need to pray for each other. How many of you thought six or eight months ago we'd be wearing a mask about it everywhere we go out in public? How, how many of us thought that, man, we're going to have to worry about these children going back to school in a couple of weeks? And I'll be honest with you, I don't believe it's going to last long. I believe this thing will bust out. I mean, you think children get sick every year when school starts back and they spread it everywhere and it comes home. They get this thing in there, it's going to spread again. How you can see how it's done in the sports world right now, these sports teams in baseball. Hey, basketball's doing it a little different, putting them off by themselves. These fellas are traveling everywhere and everyone catching. I mean, this thing is not, I mean, this thing's not leaving nobody out. God's trying to get some attention. He's trying to open eyes, and he wants us to see this. Hey, we, we need to pray right now. We need to pray for these lost people like Cornelius. Hey, if we've ever prayed, I, I'm not no politician or politician. If we've ever prayed about an election coming up, we need to pray right now. Because, man, we're, we're seeing things change in this world. It's never going to be the same again. But if a certain things happen this November, we'll see things change in this world and never be the same again. I mean, we're living in dangerous times. We're seeing things go on 
that's went on overseas in some of these countries. And next thing you know, these countries are destroyed. The next thing you know, they're living under communism. Next thing you know, they got people in that country living in concentration camps. You say, that ain't, that's not possible. Hey, you better open your eyes. It's right before us. Hey, I, I've studied this book pretty good on the last day's prophecy book, Revelation. I still ain't found out where the USA is at in any of that. You can find a lot of them others coming into Bible over there. And then in Armageddon, where are we at? Man, we're living in dangerous times right now. Most powerful country in the world, but I'm, I'm just going to be honest, ain't being smart. But we're some of the stupidest people I've ever seen things that we let go on. I mean, plain talk is what ought to be done. I mean, we, we sit back and watch a lot of this stuff. Common sense. I mean, animals has got more sense than we do in this country anymore. Hey, I've been watching some stuff around the house there all summer. Them youngins had raised birds and bird houses all summer. Got to watching how them mamas protect them birds. Hey, them mamas ain't going to let nothing get to them. Put them in a place where the world can't touch them. What we do today, we throw them away, throw the children away, murder them, kill them. Animals has got more sins than most people does anymore. And I mean, that's about it. A lot of things that's going on goes against nature that we're doing anymore in this country. We're backing and condoning. I mean, this man, you look what the Bible said also about him. Down in verse 22. The Bible said, and they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man and one that feareth God, and of a good report among all the nation of the Jews. Hey, it was unlawful for a Jew and a Gentile to keep company. But he had a good report of the Jews. They thought well of him. This is a man that the other people thought well of, had a good report of. You ever stop and thought what kind of report people's got of you that lives around you? What kind of report do these people in this community have of you here? Hey, you've been around here a whole lot longer than I have. What kind of report do the people up and down this road have of you at this church? What kind of report does the people your neighbors have of you, your co-workers have of you? You know, that's something to think about. How do they look at you? A lot of folks say, well, I don't care what nobody thinks about me. You better care to a certain extent. Hey, I mean, I, I, I care that I live right before somebody. Now, if they don't like that, I mean, that's where I begin to not care, but I love them. But we need to care about what people, how they, how they look at us. Do they see us as being a Christian? Hey, here's Cornelius, man. They had a good report of him. He was doing everything right. How many of us could that be said about? This man had a good character. He had a good reputation. A lot of good things said about him. Hey, he's a devout man. He feared God. He gave much alms. He prayed to God. He had a good report. Hey, you look down in verse 3 through 7. I'm not going to take time to read all that because of time. But you know, God sent a vision to Cornelius. Told him he needed to send to get some men to get Simon Peter. Hey man, we're talking about one he was sending to to get that denied Christ after his death. Hey, we're talking about the one that preached the greatest message ever was there early on in the book of Acts. Thousands saved. You say you believe God when you some of God used that man after he denied him. Put the power of God up on him. Let him walk on the water. Hey, we're talking about a rough man that God used. You remember the book of Acts? Now, Peter was to, was to come down to this man's house and preach. But remember, the book of Acts is a transition book from law to grace. Hey, the apostles had only been up to this time had been going out and preaching to the Jews up to this point. They hadn't spread it on out yet to the Gentiles. But Cornelius sends for Peter Peter's a little bit confused, but you know, he comes to Cornelius. And you know what got me? The Bible talks about pretty much here in chapter 10. When Peter come, Cornelius had his house ready to listen to the preaching. We're talking about a man here that don't know a whole lot about God. Never been 
saved. But he had his house ready for one thing, preaching. You say, what was Peter going to preach? You look down at verse 6. The Bible said he lodgeth with Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside. And he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Now look, Peter is getting ready to find out what God wants him to preach. Down in verse 22, the Bible said the angels said, and they said Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one that feareth God, and one that good report among all nations of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee unto his house and to hear words of thee. Hey, right here's what's going on. God's wanting him to come and preach. And look what verse 33 said. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done, and thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Now Peter was sent for. He finds out what he's got to do. And here Cornelius has got his house ready. You say, well, what's Peter going to preach to him? He's going to keep it plain and simple. He's going to preach to the Gentiles just like he did to the Jews. Verse 34, the Bible said there, verse 34, the Bible said then Peter opened his mouth and said of truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of person. He's making this thing real plain to begin with, real simple. He said God's no respecter of person. He's saying there's no big eyes or little eyes. All are the same with God. He's saying it's a whosoever will salvation. He's looking at these Gentiles. Now Peter was a Jew. He's looking at it. He's saying, man, you God can save you just like he did me. There's no difference. He said, I may be a Jew, but you've got the same God that I do. Then he goes to verse 38, and the Bible said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing, and all were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Look, well, look what he's preaching also. He told them to begin with that God's no respecter of persons. And he begins to preach about Jesus. Telling a man about what kind of person he was, all the good he done, about the teaching he done. About the healing he done. About the great miracles that he done. He's telling them he is the way, the truth, and the life. These Gentiles had never heard this. They'd never been accepted. Never been brought into this trap. Peter's saying, man, we got to be all the same. And it begins with Jesus. He said it's sin. Then he go, he's told them about his probably his childhood, about his teachings, about his ministry, about his miracles. Then he goes to verse 39, man, and gets personal. And he said, We and our witnesses of all things which you did both in the land of the Jews in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. He's told them a little about Jesus. Then he takes them to Calvary. He said, this is the only way to run to Calvary. He said, they hung Jesus on a tree on an old rugged cross. You know, that used to be the message that went out all the time, Calvary. Don't hear it preached on much anymore. Don't hear hell preached on much. But when we forget about Calvary, we're forgetting about where it all got started. We're forgetting about the place, man, that the blood was shed. We're forgetting about the place that Jesus had in mind. Those folks in 2020 that's going through so much. Hey, that day when Jesus was hanging on the cross, that old priest, man, was over there in the temple getting ready to make evening sacrifice. Man, but he didn't realize, man, there was the ultimate sacrifice taking place on a hill called Calvary. Hey man, when Jesus gave up the ghost, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom in the temple. You know what happened that day? There was a new and living way took place. They should have stuck up a sign on the front of the temple that day. Everybody come in. Come on, it's free. Hey, that old priest had to go in there every year one time and get their sins rolled back. Hey, that priest had the only one that could go behind. That veil said, keep out. Anybody that comes beyond, it's dead. But 
But ain't you glad, man, the ultimate sacrifice that day at Calvary? This is early on in the ministry here. First of the Gentiles. Look what he's preached. He told them about Jesus. Told them about Calvary. Then he goes to verse 40. He said, let's finish it up with this. He said, whom God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Then he couldn't forget what happened the third day. Hey, that third day, man, Jesus come out of that tomb. And you know, I, I, I'm honest. I, I don't believe he even waited to that third day. They just moved that tomb out of the way on the third day to let them see that he wasn't in there. Hey, he done some work out three days. He went conquered death, hell, and the grave. Somewhere during that time, he carried his own blood back into the throne room and put it on the mercy seat. Hey, he told them about him getting up. Told them about him that they saw him. So many days after he got up, he sat and eat with them. Then they saw him ascend back into heaven. And the angels told them he'd come back the same way he left in the clouds. Hey, they're just keeping this thing simple. Hey, could you imagine back then all Peter and them had, man, was the book. They didn't have all these other books we've got today. And there's nothing wrong with commentaries and books and devotions. Man, I, I've got a building full. I mean, of good authors, it helps people. You imagine all them men had was Jesus and the Holy Ghost. And they preached what the Holy Ghost said. And you know it worked. People got saved. Look what it said in verse 42. I'll be done here in just a second. The Bible said he commanded us to preach unto the people and testify that he is which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. The Bible said that he was commanded to preach to them. Hey, I, I'm glad there was some preacher listening to God one day and preached to me. I, I'm glad all them old men preached to me when I was coming up. But God laid some messages on a man's heart back in Ju back in 1980 in July. I got saved on the 31st on a Thursday night about 8.30. But God laid some messages on that old man's heart that whole week. But Irby McKinney was his name. He's more in Elizabethan, Tennessee. I, I believe he used to, was from Mitchell County of the, originally. Then he became the pastor of our church a little while later. That, that man preached every night that week to me. But that Thursday night, God gave me a little mercy and grace, extended an invitation, and I got saved. Hey, man, that's what we need, man. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Commanded him to preach. Hey, man, folks take preaching real lightly anymore. We just brush it off. Men don't get up here. A lot of men I know is getting up just to be seen, be, to be on the scene and things such as that. But we ought to be getting up here because it's a high calling. We ought to get up here because we love people. And because we want to see people saved. Hey, I talk about heaven and hell a whole lot. Hey, if we don't, how are they going to know? You never know when somebody's going to walk in that door back there it's lost. Hey, you never know when there may be somebody sitting on the church pew. Thought this saved for years. Or may have been living like this man Cornelius doing all the right things. But never really got in. Hey, old Judas had him fooled, didn't he? He was in the, in the inner circle. He was a disciple. Carried the money. Done everything right. Even kissed the door of heaven before he sold him out. Kissed Jesus on the cheek. Bible said he went out and hung himself out of that. But the Bible says that man repented himself. Hey, I don't know where Judas is at. About everybody here preach him in hell, this, that, and other. The Bible said he repented. So I don't know what he repented of. He may have got things right. Then you hear folks say, well, he committed suicide. He automatically goes to hell. That ain't the Bible either. Hey, they've been good men. I believe he's committed suicide before. Once you're saved, you don't lose your salvation. These things happen to people's minds. And they do things sometimes. I've heard that all my life. They'll go to hell if they commit suicide. I don't believe you ought to do that. It's up to God when you leave this world. But I know some good preachers that's took guns and blowed their brains out. Some of the best men I've ever heard preach. Things got to going on in their lives, their minds, depression. Let me tell you something. You, you talk about these folks that hits depression. I've heard preachers get in the pulpit telling them they need to throw their medicine.
passing away. Then before long, they're in the same shape. You better be careful. They some folks, if they ain't got that medication, they can't live and they can't function. And I know they some that just gets on that stuff and stays on it. A lot of God created doctors. Luke was a physician. Those things happen in people's minds sometimes that we don't understand. And they snap. But then I'm telling you something, when you're saved, salvation, if, if a man, get, where, where, where would you draw the line right there? When you're saved, the Bible said the gift and calling of God are without repentance. Whatever God does, He don't take it back. So He don't take salvation back. I mean, these are things, man, that a lot of people debate on, want to fuss and argue on. But you know, I'm glad no matter what happens in my life, I'm going to heaven. Nobody can take that away from me. Hey, look, he's just preaching to these people simply. All he's doing right here. Verse 43 said to him, Give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall have remission of sin. He's just telling them right there, it's through and by Jesus. You look in verse 44, look what happens. It says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. Holy Ghost conviction fell in that house. Cornelius got his house prepared. He'd been praying. Man, he was calling on God to do something in his life. Then the Holy Ghost Spirit fell on his house. And the Bible said that all that heard. Wouldn't you like to see the Holy Ghost Spirit fall around the house of God and say? I'd like to see it fall in everybody's home. And it even goes on in verse 47 and 48. talks about Peter was talking about baptizing them there. There was no difference in them and the Jew. He said, why can't we baptize them? There's no difference in us. Took them out and baptized them. Hey, folks used to get saved. They'd go out and baptize them. You don't hear much of that in there. No baptism does not save you. Baptism will get you wet. It's what it'll do. It won't save you. Baptism is an ordinance of the church just like the Lord suffered. But baptism just shows that you've had a change of nature going a different direction. A new man, old man's dead. And there's a new man. That's all baptism does. The thief on the cross never got saved. I mean, he got saved, but he never got baptized. Didn't have time to get baptized, but he went to heaven. I mean, there's a lot of things goes around every church. Got to be baptized. Got to be sprinkled. Don't line up with the book. It ain't right. A lot of people's depending on their baptism. Church I used to pastor over in Burnsville there. As old boy and girl kept coming, that boy was a had been raised as a Catholic all his life. Soon as them babies was born, him and his wife stayed into it back and forth all the time. She was a Baptist, raised in a Baptist church. Soon as them younger was born, take them and sprinkle them. They're all right. They're going to heaven. Then I, he'd come every now and then. I'd preach on hell. Oh, he'd get mad. He wouldn't go. He was right because he'd been sprinkled. And I was always good to that old boy. Never said nothing spark to him. But they're hard to get through to. I mean, they get this stuff put in their head. Hey, it's just like us. I mean, we're grounded as a Baptist. But you, you get a lot of that stuff. Man, these Catholics, man, that, that, that's a false doctrine. Every bit of it's out of hell. They're the great whore in the book of Revelation, I believe. I mean, they've done more damage to people than anything. One of the biggest organizations, most powerful, most money, more money than in a lot of corporations. Every time you turn the TV on, they're being lawed for another priest molesting a little boy. Hey, they put them men in there like that, tell them they can't get married. That don't line up with the Bible. Then they go messing with these youngins. I mean, it's a sick society we live in. I want you to stand your feet for just a minute. Bow your heads. We're not going to have any music for just a minute. If you need to come to the altar, you can come down here and spread out.